The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and welcome, everybody, to show number 20 of As We See It. That's right, the big two zero being recorded on Sunday, December 4th, 2011. I'm Ed Jupin in Boston, as Gene announced. And um, hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we're planning on actually having Gene White on one of these episodes. And uh, you folks will be able to uh, hear him chit-chat a little bit with us in person as opposed to just doing his introduction. So now, without any further ado, let's turn show number 20 over to Fred and Holly out there in Pennsylvania and St. Louis, respectively. And then later on at the end of the show, as usual, we will have another exciting adventure of Holly and the Lobster Tales. Take it away, guys. Okay, well, we're going to show off a show with uh, a little bit different tonight. Um, there's an article I'm reading it that came up from, uh, from uh, uh, API about a camera lost to see re- being returned with the help of social media. Yes, social media actually helped somebody. Apparently... Uh, it asks you, is it just how tough is your uh, average DSLR memory card? Well, apparently it's tough enough to survive a year at the bottom of the ocean because naturalist and aspiring photographer Marcus Thompson was scuba diving in Deep Bay near Vancouver, British Columbia when he found a Canon EOS 1000D, brought it to the surface, was able to recover the me- uh, memory card, recovered 50 photos. Trying to find out what happened, he took the photos, tried to find the owner, and posted up on social media on Google Plus, the one that we use here at uh, BaseNet, including the photos of the camera itself, as well as photos we're able to recover from the SD cards, 50 um, of a family vacation. They were a firefighter. He said uh, on Google Plus, if you know a firefighter from British Columbia whose team won the Pacific uh, Regional Fire Fit Competition and it has a lovely wife and now two-year-old daughter, let me know. And Basically, the story said through the camera, they got this thing back to the guy in, in British Columbia. I think that's great. And it goes to show what Google Plus and social media can actually do when they want it to. And scientifically, I wonder then if it's the pros or cons between salt water as opposed to fresh water that might have uh, kept this preserved? Might be. Or how about, how about the uh, temperature of the water? I don't know. But, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh... I, I think it was just so well sealed in the camera that, you know, that it didn't get exposed to the elements outside, which I just think, I just think it's crazy that that thing survived. Yeah, that's why I'm looking at it scientifically. Uh, maybe cold, as Fred said, because just as if a, um, a human or an animal or anything would be submerged in ice water, you know, all of your body functions slow down or almost stop and you could actually be revived then. Um, but also I'm thinking along the lines of either salt water as opposed to fresh water. Um, something for somebody like Larry the Lobster to look into. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe we can come up with some facts and figures as to uh, whether, it, you know, the salt water or the cold or something had something they, to do with it. But pretty cool have, regardless. They did have pictures of the camera. The camera's pretty all rotted out, but... It's, uh, we, you know, we've seen the power of social media to spread information about important events and natural disasters. Nice, finally, to see it work on something on a much smaller personal scale. And while obvi- obviously the camera's a total loss, which we all know it is, the family's able to secure the vacation photos, not to mention the story that they'll be able to share for a lifetime. So it's, it's a great idea, a great thing. And, you know, kudos to Canon for building a camera. And kudos, of course, to our guys over at Google+, Plus, which, again, we use on uh, BaseNet. And, uh, you know, they did, they did this time, I'm glad, the social media did a job, and it did a, did a well job, and everybody deserves a, 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 good, a, good, a good, you know, thing for everything. So I'm glad cool. to see that one came out good. Cool story. Yeah, I think that's really neat. You know, they say the world's getting smaller, and I think stories like this just show that, you know, we, we are a global community able to reach out and help each other out if we need to. There's a, a story that came over the AP Wire recently. That Toby McGuire came over the AP wire. Is there still an AP wire? Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, tick, uh, tick, 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 tick. We need the tick, 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 tick in the background then on this show. Don't <laughs> we? 
Anyway, but they're uh, Toby McGuire. For people who don't know it, I don't know who would know it was the uh, star of the first two Spider. I don't know if it's the third one, but the first two Spider-Man movies. And he's settling a apparently he's settling over poker winnings. Now, according to AP, the uh, Toby McGuire has decided to fold him and settle a lawsuit over his winnings from a convicted con man during a high stakes Hollywood poker game. The Spider Man was uh, agreed to pay eighty thousand dollars to settle a lawsuit to filed. For more than $311,000, he was paid by a convicted Ponzi scheme operator in the Texas Hold'em matches that included celebrities, businessmen, and other, uh, and other and other court documents. State now, what bothers me about this that unless they knew this guy made his money through a Ponzi scheme, why would Toby McGuire be responsible for paying back anything? Well, this is actually really interesting. Um, This is sort of similar to what happened uh, in the really famous case of this just a few years ago. Um, You know, the, uh, you know, he didn't know, they didn't know. But the point is, the people who did get screwed out of money are without money. And I think that, you know, these guys stepping forward and saying, hey, we'll pay a little bit of it. We were duped is a really nice thing. I don't think that they should be held responsible for it. But I think the fact that they're willing to be responsible for it is is kind of cool. And it's a great, it's a great thing. But, but, but the thing that people have to remember, about Ponzi schemes, the same thing, the old adage that, my, that mom used to tell us years ago, if something sounds too good to be true, it generally is. And what is, if you know, even know off the top of your head, um, we hear this meme a lot lately, Ponzi schemes. Um, what is a Ponzi scheme, in case anybody isn't familiar with the term? Well... It's- Go ahead. Uh, you know, I'm just Wikipediaing it right now. Consult the book of knowledge. That's right. That's how I work. Um, okay, we got it. It's a fraudulent investment operation that pays returns to its investors from their own money or the money paid in by subsequent investors. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, what defines fraudulent, you know? Well, it's usually used by people who are offering higher returns to some investors than to others, and then eventually... Yeah, you know, they realize there's no money at the end of the tunnel. Well, it's all, it's also like it's also it's also ba- it, but they are based on the old pyramid scheme. Where pyramid the scheme, people, right? You know, where, where you invest two dollars and I pay you back four. I get the four dollars from four more people that I've invested to pay you back your four dollars. Getting eight more people, pay those four people back, paying you back your four dollars. Which obviously, in theory, is an awesome idea, but it just never seems to work. The problem is that you get to the point where the the the, the, ba- the base flatline base of the pyramid has to be so large that Everybody in the world would have to be involved in order for people to... And the only people make any money are the people that get into the beginning. That started it, right. But yeah. if you look at the people that got involved in the Bernie Madoff uh, things, I mean, you're talking Fred Wolpont and the New York Mets. These people are investing money, pension money. They're investing team money in his case. They're investing money into something that, that you know, was too good to be true. And shame on them for doing the... Shame on Madoff for doing this but shame on these people for trying to get rich quick because there are better ways of doing it and i don't feel sorry for a lot of these people i don't feel sorry for, i feel sorry for the people that got duped into it but a lot of these people had a lot of money to begin with they got caught up in something they were they were that they were greedy and they got caught up in something that they, that they should have known better yeah i would i would imagine that there are people that if they only have ten dollars to spare in their pocket, they might say, "Well, I'm going to invest the ten bucks in this because as of tomorrow, I might have twenty dollars. I'll double my That's money." Right. But if it yeah. sounds too good to be true, it Go generally ahead, is. Well, this particular uh, example, the guy was running a Texas Hold'em game, and I would imagine for you know, I'd have to. I do actually have a, a family member who's a professional poker player. It's not unusual that you would walk away from a high stakes poker game with. Uh, he made three hundred and eleven thousand dollars. That's actually not unusual, and not, you know, the buy-in for these games is typically pretty high, and then the payoff is typically pretty high. So, you know, I, I could see how in that situation it would be difficult to identify this was a Ponzi scheme because a high stakes poker game. You know, would would have a gambling uh, big money, right? Exactly, it'd be big money, big losses, and it, it's not uncommon to have a high pay-in that you expect to lose. So I could see how that would be really easy to miss. You know. Anyway, the uh, the, the Ponzi scheme. Just on a uh, on a side note, it named it the Charles Ponzi, who became mm. notorious for using the techniques in the 1920s. Yeah, I just, scheme. Okay. 
But it was ba- uh, uh, for example, Charles Dickens 18 four, uh, 1844 novel, The Life and Adventures of Martin Chesilwell, described such a scheme. And it, it's an operation to make money in a quick way. It's a get-rich-quick mm-hmm. scheme. And these people got caught. I think it's a great idea that Toby McGuire gave to, is giving part of the money back, like you said, Holly. But I don't think the court should have gotten involved in it because, I mean – if they don't know, you can't really hold them responsible for what this guy's doing. They're just playing poker with this guy. So, you know, it is and it isn't. I think, I think you know, Toby McGuire should be com- complimented for giving it back. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's great that, that he did that. But I think that, you know, it says, like his statement says, you know, he didn't violate any laws or rules or regulations in the poker game. But he, was, but he wasn't going to fight the case because it was going to cost him a lot more to fight it than it would oh, yeah, for him yeah. just to pay the 80000 and help out the people who, who lost money in this game, you know. So, I mean, in some in some ways, I mean, you know, nobody ever does anything good if it doesn't do something good for them. And he also was saving money on a lawsuit. And the truth of the matter is if the courts don't go after everybody involved, they're never going to catch the key player because unless there is, again, unless there's some risk to them, they're not going to take the risk to out somebody, you know. Oh, so yeah. in, in a lot of ways, I feel like the court has to make everybody culpable because otherwise they're never going to catch the, the bad guy, as they and say. can't prove who knew what anyway, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, our next uh, story uh, covers a will that was written by a Montana heiress to a copper mine, and the newly publicized will by an heiress of a Montana copper mining fortune leaves more than $400 million of money to a state, while a will signed just weeks later left nothing to her relatives. The child is Huguette Clark. Died in May at age 104, and you gotta love that, 104. And where Last was this? Breath of, what's that? Where was this? New York. Childless Hoget Clark died in New York. She blast breath of New York's gilded age and uh, that produced the Rockefellers, Astros, and Vanderbilts. Her relatives brought a new will to light on Monday. They filed court papers asking a surrogate's court in Manhattan to involve them in the proceedings uh, about how her money was spent and by whom. She lived in a uh, 42-room Manhattan home, the largest residence on Fifth Avenue. And decades earlier, the uh, the uh, which she had done, she left it, and she had left uh, the, wanted to live undisturbed at the at a, at a hospital in Manhattan. And I mean, she, I mean, and the court, you know, ordered the county of the Paris-born heiress's fortune is overseen by Bach and Campbell in the last 15 years of her life as chilling report of mishandling and misappropriation and mismanagement of her assets. The relative's lawyer claimed in a paper filed Monday. These people, if she was 104 years old, who knows? But the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has been looking into the into Clark's affairs were managed in the past two decades. People familiar with the program. I mean, it's this this is one of the things where you know, the the family is pissed off, and rightfully so. But well, and don't don't we hear about stories like this all the time? Whether it's a, a 42 room mansion in this case, or somebody's uh, four square foot log cabin in Indiana somewhere. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, when somebody's up in age, you know, 104 years old like that, <laughs> you have all kinds of people coming out of the woodwork trying to take advantage of whatever assets there are. And well, I, the- I think, I don't know if we've heard this story a lot in real life, but we've certainly seen episodes of like, you know, dramas about it. You know, like I feel like there were probably yep. seven episodes of Dallas that had this very same yeah. plot line. But well, like... The- you know what? What think about it from her perspective? This lady, as you know, Ed said, is very old, and it says in in most of the articles, you know, her family went to the went to the courts and said, "Oh, we've got to appoint a guardian for her. She's just too much trouble for us to handle." So they appointed a guardian, and she had a nurse, and then she, you know, they say late in her life she cre- she gave all she decided to give all her money to her charity and to her nurse. And I'm sorry, but if you're her, you're looking at your family who's not taking responsibility, <laughs> and here's somebody who's taking care of you. Well, look I mean, at- I'm not saying she did or she didn't. And obviously, the courts will decide that, but I can see why she would. Look oh, at yeah. look at Helmsley as well. Uh, you know, the Queen of Mean there in New York City that I left her. that left all of her money to her dog, and her dog got the money. And it was just one day, sometime last year, that the dog died, and the dog's money now went to the state of New York. So I ultimately, Helmsley landed up leaving her money to the state of New York because after her dog died, who got her money? The state got it, so <laughs> why not just leave it to the state in the first well, place? Well, I mean, the, the thing is, that this also, that there's also, uh, this also reeks of, uh, of the old, if anybody's ever seen the movie Melvin and Howard, of the old uh, Melvin Dumar, a gas station guy out of out of Salt Lake area, allegedly 
was left billions of dollars by the late Howard Hughes. Mm -hmm. And he uh, presented a copy of the will to the Saint, uh, the um, Salt Lake Courthouse and went through, and there was a movie about that song, Paul Lamette. And he uh, realized that he'd never get the money because a huge corporation would never let him see a dime. But he wanted people to know that what, that, that what he, the story, he said that, that, that the story was true. Now, whether it was or not, I'll never know, but it's just, you know, this happens all the time. I mean, I'm, sh I'm surprised that, that we haven't heard anything about Michael Jackson's will yet. Uh, who it leaves it to. But there's even going through that with this because his mother wants to be the executor of the estate and his father wants to be the executor of the estate and what's going on with the kids. So it's going to be, it's all good. It all comes up with that. Anytime you have that kind of money going on. Yeah, I can see that being something that people would argue over, you know, in the case of, you know, Clark, as we've said, is one of the old big money families. And Helmsley, obviously, was one of the big New York money, you know, money makers. And I, I mean, especially if you have people who you feel, you know, and I can see, you know, being one of these people who's not particularly easy to get along with either. It can be difficult to figure out who who and where you want your resources to go. And when you've worked that hard and you have that much I mean, I, I could see how this would be this would be something worth fighting over. I tell you, Leona could have left the money to me. I would have made sure that the dog, dog was taken care of. That Heck dog yeah. would have lived in a lap of luxury. <laughs> oh, yeah. But well, this would like be that said, you know, the money goes to the dog at that point and it winds up going to the state. I mean, it's a, that just, that, that's just obscene. <laughs> that's just obscene. But it is her right to do that. Exactly. Well, going away from uh, the lap of luxury here, we have a story about McDonald's this week. Yes, we do. And, uh, you know, it seems that in California, uh, there, you know, I, I'm always surprised when I hear that San Francisco makes things illegal. But it looks like in California, they've actually said now that unless Happy Meals uh, are lower calorie and healthier, they're not allowed to offer plastic toys to not, kids. Not allowed to offer for free. Let's go to our little 10 second clip and then we'll pick it up. And a pretty decisive measure coming out of San Francisco as well from the city's Board of Supervisors, which approved yesterday a measure that bans McDonald's from offering a free toy in children's meals. It only applies to meals that are high in calories and fat. Yeah, well, so it, apparently. So it's, apparently. Actually, it's actually a city ordinance. That, uh, the the uh, Oak Brook-based McDonald's will instead be offering for 10 cents with Happy Meals or Mite Kid Meals. I've never heard of that which are, I guess, aimed at older children, but it's a San Francisco ordinance. The San Francisco's change also affects the chain restaurants that offers toys as incentives to children, McDonald's in the spotlight of the world. I mean, all that's going to happen, McDonald's going to offer the meals, charge 10 cents for it, and make millions more dollars. So, you know, it, it, it's, it is what it is. Yeah, and as it said in the clip, and as Holly said, that it's only on um, high-calorie or high-fat meals. Anyway, it's not on all of their kids' meals. And kids include kids meals that either contain more than 600 calories, don't include a fruit and vegetable, or include a sugary drink. So if I take away the sugary drink and put in a fruit, I can charge you 10,000 calories and give you a free Happy Meal. Well, I'm seeing a um, subject here for our new soon-to-be-named show that's going to be premiering in sometime in January with um, Holly Hurley hosting along with Jill Henley. Uh, we have our own little basinet version of The View coming up. Um, and Jill specifically is going to be touching on a lot of these family type topics. She's got a couple young kids herself. And this is the type of topic that's going to be discussed on that show. So I think Holly, uh, you and Jill and whoever else joins you too, um, will be discussing topics like this quite a bit. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think this will definitely be something on the table. The really exciting thing I think about our upcoming podcast is the women that uh, we're talking about bringing on, because obviously, you know, you we, we find often a lot of times with podcasts, you always have a, a lot of male hosts and then maybe one, you know, here I am, you know, as you call it, the token woman, you know, but I think uh, I think when you can get some really intellectual women together and uh, let them talk as well, you know, you can come up with a with just a slightly different take on things. And I think what's great about the podcast we have coming is, you know, we've got Jill who uh, who's a mother and who has fantastic opinions about uh, sort of the the relevance of stories like this to your home life. You know, um, I'm in business school right now. I've had a history as being a producer and then uh, actually uh, doing marketing for fitness after that. And so, you know, obviously I have a base in which I have certifications, you know, in nutrition and things like that. And then, of course, you know, we're going to have women coming on who have expertise in areas like communications, uh, you know, people who are even further along in business than I am 
time now. Obviously, I'm, uh, you know, just now getting my MBA. And, you know, women who are really successful in, uh, you know, technology, actually. I know, uh, Ed, you have some friends uh, through through the Internet who are unbelievably uh, accomplished uh, techno wizards. And so, you know, what I like is that we, we, we're going to have this huge variance of women all together talking about stuff. And I think we're going to get some really nice, views on things really from different angles i'm pretty excited good so that'll be coming up sometime in mid-january so everybody just keep an eye on our social media posts for the exact uh day and time of the first episode of that so so <laughs> get it, getting back to mcdonald's or um do you guys have well, any more on that or are we moving it, you on know, it, it doesn't it doesn't really bother me that they're doing this because i think it's a good idea it's it's, it's, it's something that you know I, you know, I I have a problem with them leg with, with legislating something like that at 600 calories, because you know now I mean, you know they've been doing McDonald's been in business for seven almost 70 years now since 1940s when when Ray Kroc bought it from the McDonald brothers in San Bernardino, and you know I mean they've they people have been eating it you know it depends upon how they've been eating it it's been it's been it's not meant to be a replacement meal for any kind of meal it's meant to be get you know get in get out and go but i mean to sit there and tell people well you can't give away a, you can't give away a character and a happy meal thinking it's going to stop people from buying them it's not going to stop if the kid wants a happy meal you're going to pay the 10 cents for the toy so i mean it, that, it's it's kind of ridiculous doing that it, it, it just get, give mcdonald's more money now because they're going to walk in and buy the toy for a dime now i mean come on well, you know, I, I think, I mean, I think in the, in the long run, I don't think the people who crafted this were as smart as, as you, as you are actually, Fred, to be honest. But I think the point is that they, McDonald's is actually utilizing this as a positive thing. You know, they're giving the extra 10 cents to the Ronald McDonald house. And they're also just sort of making children aware that eating bad things is bad enough for you that there's a mandate on it. You know, I think, I think anything that takes us a, a step closer to, to healthier eating habits is a good so thing. So it's, it's twofold. It could, it could keep the kids away from these uh, high-calorie, fatty meals. And also it's a backdoor in to, uh, like you said, giving a dime to the Ronald McDonald house. Which is a, good, which is a very, very, very good idea and a good charity. Well, and, you know, and I, and I think that is a positive spin on it. But I also think, you know, I think the, the goal of this mandate, whether or not I think it was particularly accurately applied, is, you know, just to raise awareness, um, because I think that, that there has been a lot of success in raising awareness to helpful foods lately. I think we've seen a lot of more, a lot more whole grain come on the market. You've seen parents taking much more cautious steps about what they're feeding their kids, because I don't know about you guys, but I ate garbage when I was like eight years old. I was, I was uh, overweight before I was like 12. I still eat garbage. I don't eat well at all. Well, the thing is, when I was a kid, we, you know, we, we, I grew up in a town where the first McDonald's was in Fairlawn, New Jersey, in Bergen County, and my, we lived, my, well, what do we live, mile and a half away, Ed, something not like that, e not even, that, not even. So, you know, we were able to drive there. And my parents took us there as a treat. It was not, we were not allowed to eat that kind of stuff at home, and that's part of the problem. Is that people, a lot of parents, and not all of them, please, you know, no letters, no cards, but a lot of parents are using this as uh, using McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, any of these major fast food restaurants are using it as a replacement for meals. You're absolutely you right. And up until the time I was 10 years old or something, I'll bet you I went to McDonald's 10 times. Yeah. Um, when we did go out to eat, we didn't go out to diners. My father happened to have not been a fan of diners, but we went to other sit down type family restaurants and you went out and we had a lot of ethnic food at the day, uh, you know, our Polish, Russian, Hungarian traditions on my family, on both sides of my family. And we'd go out to restaurants where we'd have pierogies and so on and so forth. Um, but that was it. We went down to sit down restaurants. So... As you said, Fred, up until the time I was 10, 15 years old, I probably went to McDonald's 10 or 15 times only. And from the time you were 10 or you were 17, you had to go with your father, so you probably went another 10 times. Yeah. Well, and you had your driver's license. Yeah, there you go. go. And even then, and by that time, we weren't going that much because, I, you know, McDonald's, I mean, as much as I like, as much as I've eaten McDonald's in my lifetime, I've always said, you know, McDonald's food may not be the best, may not be the best that you can get, but when you're going cross country like we did, it was always safe to stop at McDonald's so you knew what you were getting. It, it that, has it has enormous amounts of consistency. Right, and that and that and that's important when you're traveling. But when you have like even even now in Pennsylvania here, I mean, I live 
about eight miles from McDonald's. We have a pizza place a couple miles away, and my wife is still tonight cooking spaghetti for dinner. I mean, we don't go. To, first of all, you can't afford to go out spend. No, you can't go out and eat every day. I mean, it, it's twenty-five dollars a day going out to eat. It's expensive. It's more expensive, than it, and it's really not that good for you. But you have kids now. You had people a couple of years ago sued McDonald's as a kid was a blimp because he was eating McDonald's three times, three meals a day. Well, you know, something shame on you for letting your kid do it. Yep. Shame on the kid for doing it. Well, and this, I think, is, I think you've actually just vocalized the difference between your generation and mine. You know, parents in my generation, both parents worked, always. And I don't know if you guys were, were the anomaly in your era in which both your parents worked. But I know for me, my mother worked, you know, over, well over 40 hours a week. She worked six days, six full work days a week. She did not take Saturdays off, you know. She and my father, you know, both didn't really have that much time for their kids. And my mom always say, they tell you, they tell you you can get it all, but you can't have it all, you know. And I think the difference was because... Because our mothers were working and we grew up in an era where that happened, there was a huge, and I think the statistics have shown, there's a huge uptick in people doing fast food. Because your mother's not at home cooking anymore. Well, you know? I, part of it is also the upbringing of the parentage. Ed's parents, my parents, well, my parents are European. My, father's, my father was first generation coming to this country. My mother was born here and raised in Europe. So they were both, so it, it, the idea of coming home from work and even cooking, my mother worked for 30 years for a doctor full time, came home and still cooked dinner. So, you know, we still had the, the, the home cooked meals most nights. And that's only because that's the way they did it. We in this country, as much as technology we have because our people are working through, we have kids that are almost feeding themselves, and that's where you leave 20 bucks on the counter, and the kid can go get his pizza, he can go get McDonald's, he can go get the, the fast food, and, and, and it's fast, it's easy. Or the parents are driving home, they can go through the drive through they can grab the fast food and take it home, and it makes it easy. And that was also the time period, as Holly said, back in a generational thing, back in the 50s or 60s. Uh, there's one of the many classic Honeymooners episodes with Jackie Gleason. What are you trying to do? Poison me? What are you talking about? I'm talking about my lunch. That's what I'm talking about. What did you try to do? Make an Exhibit A in a murder case? Just what's wrong with those sandwiches? What's wrong with them? They were so bad the lunchbox got hot burned. <laughs> Why did you ever get an idea for food like that? I was just trying to think of something different for you, Ralph. I got the idea from a radio program from the mystery chef. The mystery chef? <laughs> he cooks like that, no wonder he wants to keep his identity a secret. <laughs> Look, you might as well know it now. The human body is like a machine. It's got to have the right fuel or it won't run. I'm not getting the right fuel in my lunchbox. All right, Ralph, you'll get fuel. Tomorrow I'll stick a lump of coal in your lunchbox. <laughs> yeah, it'll taste a lot better than what I had today. Yeah? There wasn't enough in there to feed a bird. You know what Fred Harvey's wife gives him for lunch? Three roast beef sandwiches, two hard-boiled eggs, a container of soup, bread and butter, a thermos full of coffee, a couple of pieces of pie, and plenty of fruit. He brushes more food off his vest than I have in my lunchbox. <laughs> I suppose well, you're on, not I'm wasting I'm... away. Yes, I am wasting away. I was a lot heavier than this. What do you think all the fat went? Up there, fathead. <laughs> Don't start anything. Don't start anything. Let me have my dinner. Your dinner isn't fixed, and I'm not going to fix it. Since you've become the food expert around here, you can fix it yourself. I'm going up to Trixie's. All right, I will fix it myself. And I'll do a better job than you could. You hear me? <laughs> That's how it was in the 50s, 60s. Uh, the, the man came home from work, and dinner was on the table for him. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think because of the frequency with which our generation goes out to eat, you know, do I think that regulation is the way to get there? Maybe, maybe not, but somehow there have to, you know, and I think as a result of us eating out all the time, there there popped up a lot of healthier chains, you know, the subways of the world, the places where you can, you know, quote unquote, eat fresh very quickly. And But I think, I think because of the frequency with which our generation eats out and doesn't eat at home, there have now popped up more healthy options. And McDonald's, no, no, no exemption 
transition from that. They have definitely made some strides in the way of offering more healthy foods. And I don't think for them that this was a difficult thing to overcome because it's just a, you know, for them, it's just another small change in a very large, successful corporation. I'll tell you, I don't, I don't know how good it is and I'm not giving an endorsement to McDonald's, but the past couple of times I've been there, I've had their McChicken sandwich as opposed (laughs) to a burger. And I'll tell you, that stupid little chicken sandwich isn't half bad, at least in taste. And I kind of think that if I'm going to go to McDonald's, I almost think that at least psychologically, I'd rather eat their McChicken sandwich than a burger, and I think that I'm accomplishing something. But, you know, Holly, also, there is a difference between going out to eat and having fast food. There's a big difference. I mean, you well, fast food in air quotes, you, you know, fast food in air quotes is primarily known for being loaded with sodium and, you know, salt. I mean, That's yeah, fast I food. Think, yeah, that, that, that is really restaurant is different than going to McDonald's. I mean, we all know that. And when you and your husband go out to eat, you're normally not going to McDonald's. You're probably going to a sit down restaurant of some kind. Well, sometimes, but I also think about, you know, when I was in high school, I, you know, and I, I'm sure, you know, you knew people like this, you know, I had back-to-back activities until like nine or 10 o'clock at night, and I was responsible for feeding myself in the 10 minutes I had, and whereas I, as I agree, I don't think McDonald's is even the healthiest version of chicken you can get, if it comes down between having a grilled chicken sandwich and having a candy bar, the grilled chicken sandwich is a healthier meal, and I oh, think yeah. having, you know, having those options for people who need that, that uh, who only have that 10 minutes is going to be is has been I think the way that McDonald's has successfully altered its strategy and I think this will just be another you know another tick in that direction yeah part of that is even is even on Tuesday we we're already talking about doing our uh, New York shoot for the uh, base at holiday special on Tuesday we're all going to be meeting and we already have the we're going to be meeting for lunch or a late snack or whatever you want to call it at you know mm-hmm. at, at a restaurant in Manhattan where we normally meet that we like to go to and and it's a regular sit-down restaurant. It's, it's, not, it's like a New Jersey diner in the middle of Manhattan where you can get not, anything any time of day. It's, it's real food. food. It's, not, it's real good it's real food. real food. And, you know, it's a nice place that we thought we found, accidentally found, and we like the place. That's where we go in, our, in New York. And, by the way, and if we can get them as a sponsor of this show, then we'll be glad to name them. And if anybody wants to join us in New York, it'll be Tuesday on uh, over at Rockefeller Center, Tuesday evening. Nice. Okay, what's I, next? You know, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, what's next? I think we've run McDonald's and fast food into the- Yeah, we've run McDonald's into the door, into the yeah, thing. So. I, yeah, you know, I was I was just thinking about uh, the other new show that we have about the, the political show. I'm really curious as to what they're going to say about the uh, Republican debate this this, uh, this week. There's been a lot going on, and I just want to hear everything that they have Yeah, their, uh, our first show is up on the air. Holly is talking about our new show called Viewpoint with Tony Mazzucco and Michael Dow. Uh, everybody could give a listen to that if you haven't already. Um, it was a very good introductory show. And they're working right now on show number two, which hopefully we can get over the next two weeks. We can get on the air. And, um, yeah, I've, I've already – I'm not personally involved in that show as I am in this one as far as being on the air with them. I just produce it for them. But I've given them some suggestions saying that, matter of fact, I was on Facebook and Twitter and everything with both Michael and uh, Tony during um, – the little thing down in Georgia where um, Herman Cain was suspending his campaign yesterday. And I said, well, you know, guys, come on, you know, we got to get show number two together here because we've got a lot that you guys have a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on. Yeah, I just that's exactly what I was talking about. As you know, the whole uh, New Gingrich, you know, New Gingrich, I really feel like has been the phoenix of this uh, of this Republican thing because uh, even Republicans after his term, you know, as uh, as the Speaker of the House, you know, had sort of written him off as being all done. And I think that in and this even campaign, a year ago that was the case. Uh, all of his campaign workers walked out on him about a year ago. He ran out of money a year ago, and look at where he is now. Yeah, did not see it coming. I gotta say, and did definitely didn't see Kane just being, you know, besieged by this by this uh, sexual deviant business. <laughs> now I, I don't know that I saw that particularly coming, but I saw this is the uh, typical ending of Kane. I this doesn't surprise me at all. He but that's does. that's a subject for another show. And <laughs> so so, what do you guys have next? Uh, well, I think uh, you had some entertainment news for us, didn't you? Didn't I you want to go into your entertainment segment? Yeah. So going into uh, Holly's little entertainment segment here, we'll get it started off saying that uh, 
Breaking Dawn, um, the latest vampire movie, is now number one for three weeks in a row. Very good. Uh, this past week, it dropped some 59% or so, but it still took in $16.9 million. And it's up to, in the past three weeks, up to $247.3 million. The Muppets were number two this week with a measly $11.2 million. But that was only three yeah, and a half you know, million. Do you, have a, do you have a figure of what it cost to make Breaking Dawn by any chance? Couldn't tell you. Uh, let's see here. Well, you know what? I can I can get that number for you. Um, but you know they're calling they're actually calling Breaking Dawn the smallest and tallest of the uh, of the Twilight films because it's actually about twenty million dollars off of both New Moon and Eclipse, which were the second and third films in the movie franchise. And they're actually finding that um, they're actually finding that it's making less per weekend, but it's significantly it's coming out on top more weekends in a row because God bless you know the Muppets and everything else that's big that's coming out. I mean they even said like Immortals was expected to maybe eclipse it. Hugo they thought might the Muppets they thought might, but nothing nothing seemed to be able to take it over. And it just it seems to be making less than the previous films, but more than everything else that's at the box office, which right, is what I think right. is really interesting. I mean, you would think, you know, it being, you know, I know with the Harry Potter series, you know, as we got towards the end of the franchise, they really started lapping the other movies. So that's, I think that's interesting. Just, I don't know, I don't know what the reason would be for that, but maybe that it's not the final, it's the second to last or, but I thought that was really interesting. And before you go on to any of your other Hollywood topics, I don't know what you might have this week. As we're coming up into the holiday season here, one of my favorite Christmas songs of all time is Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree by Brenda Lee. Well, Brenda Lee at the time, in 1958, she was only 13 years old when she recorded that song. And a follower of ours on Google+, Plus, as Fred just mentioned, uh, just before we came on the air, it happened to mention that, geez, I didn't realize that she was only 13 years old when she recorded that song, because if you listen to it, she sounds so much older. And there's another generational thing, as Holly said, um, you compare the 13-year-old Brenda Lee in 1958 to some of the younger singers today, and what a difference, musically, um, professionally, everything. And rocking around the Christmas tree, just a little lobster fact here to take away a little bit out of your segment. It only sold 5,000 copies when it initially came out. It was a huge, huge flop. And it went on eventually, and I don't know what they mean by eventually, but eventually it went on to sell over 5 million copies. And of course, rocking around the Christmas tree, by no matter who covered it, and especially the original by Brenda Lee, um, is just a huge Christmas a huge classic. Um, but only 5,000 copies originally sold. And that's my entertainment news. And I got that information that I asked about. The budget on the film on Twilight Breaking Dawn was was $110 million. And its growth, the weekend gross was $42 million. The total gross is two so far is, uh, and as of 25th November, $221 million. So they made some money on that one. Yeah, I think they're they're currently. I think the the article I have is from earlier today was at a, was at two forty eight. But you're right, they did they made a bit. But you know what the thing is though is I think when you put when you're a small stu, uh, before taking on the Twilight series, Summit was actually a really really small studio, and they're in the middle of a merge. Uh, according to most recent uh, articles, they're in the middle of a merge with Lionsgate. Um, which I think will be really good for both both parties involved. But the uh, but Summit was actually a very small studio before they made these, and 110 million dollars is a lot to lay down. I mean, obviously they've been very successful in the aftermath of the Twilight series and have a little bit more money to throw around. But this is their big money maker, you know, and returning like you know 200 to you know like 250 uh, percent on your investment is good but if you think about um this as a business compared to something like the pharmaceutical industry they expect they expect a 10 to 1 return on everything that they sell so you know if you're a movie studio you're making a bunch of little films for a little bit you need these big blockbusters to do huge numbers to really not only pay themselves off and pay the people involved but also pay for the next movie oh yeah you're sort of counting on that return. Um, I, you know, this is uh, speaking of life after death, if you will, or death in general. It appears that uh, Paul Abdul and uh, Nicole Skirchinger, you know, from the from the Pussycat Dolls, who was on Dancing with the Stars, are getting death threats. 
Uh, they're they're hosting the X Factor now, uh, which is you know the new Simon Cowell show, and uh, apparently they've been getting death threats. Um, so I think that's I just. I think Paula Abdul has been getting those for a while, even from uh, when she was on American Idol. Well, I mean, and don't you think out of everyone on American Idol, like, it wouldn't be news if Simon Cowell was getting death threats, I imagine. <laughs> I, I was a huge fan of Paula Abdul back in the late 80s when she was popular as a singer slash dancer. Um, I certainly wouldn't think about sending her death threats. I'd send her love letters. Come on. That's what I'm saying. I mean, she's you got to be some kind of whack job to be doing that stuff, though. Yeah, I mean, she's, like, supposed to be the queen of nice, you know, and I, and I hate to say this, but, like, who are these people sending death threats to them? Like, get a life. There's so many meaner people out there you could threaten to kill. Like, what are <laughs> you doing that's really affecting your well-being? <laughs> you know? I don't know. I don't know. And we really shouldn't be laughing about it because it really, it, it really is a tragedy. Some of these people, I mean, they've gotten, you know, the, the people getting death threats all the time. These poor people are just living their lives trying to make a living. Well, look and, at Hinckley that attempted the assassination on uh, Ronald Reagan because of his obsession with Jodie Foster. Oh man, that's such a that's such a fantastic historical twisted love story, and God bless him because Jodie Foster would not have been interested. <laughs> she has other interests that don't involve. That's right. You know. Absolutely. <laughs> leave, it, leave it there. <laughs> and I will. We'll move on to some more rel- some newer news. The uh, that'll, that'll Taylor- go, that'll, you can do that one on your show. Oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah, I think actually that would be an excellent topic for my That's show. Very interesting subject. <laughs> actually, if I could get Jodie Foster to come Yeah, maybe show. you could get Jodie Foster. There you go. <laughs> that would be the best thing that ever happened to me, actually. That'd be great. Um, but uh, Taylor Swift is, uh, speaking of Queen of Nice, has taken home Billboard's Woman of the Year this year. She changed her hairstyle, by the way. Oh, yeah? That's Do we have photos of that? I'd love to yeah, that. that doesn't help our podcast. <laughs> She's got uh, straight hair and bangs now. She said she always wanted bangs. <laughs> I was going to get him. Let's call me hair forward. Duh. I got to tell you. She's got this really big 80s style, naturally curly hair. So she's got a big head of curly hair, naturally. And she always wanted bangs. So now she has straight hair with bangs. Oh, I guess. Um, I'm interested. You know, Ed, you have shocked me uh, to the core this week between Paula, between your interest in Paula Abdul in the late 80s and now you're knowing what Taylor Swift's new haircut looks like. I mean, I don't know what happened to you this week, but you're you're a new man. I don't, I don't even know you. <laughs> no, well, country music is my thing. That's awesome. I had no idea. George Here's Strait you. and Martina McBride are the, the people. Wow. Good to know. That is very good to know. Well, I did, so how did you feel about the Minnie McCready news this week? She, as I think I emailed you, actually, she's yeah. got a history of drugs, alcohol problems and everything. Um, so it certainly doesn't surprise me. She's been either in jail and or on probation and all for drugs or alcohol. She's got a history with this. Um, this is just another one of those weird situations, I think. Yeah, it, it, apparently, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story this week, uh, Minnie McCready uh, and her son were reported missing because people couldn't find them, and they eventually found them hiding in a closet. In Arkansas, I believe. In Arkansas. Yes, and so for now they've they've uh, basically had uh, they took they took uh, her son into custody, even though she's in good condition because they just can't count on her to be a consistent parent. Well, she's and, saying, and her reaction was, "Well, he's okay. He's with me." Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and so they're they're sort of hoping she'll get her. She's been on a celebrity rehab with Dr. Drew, and you know, I mean, I think we're just hoping for her sake, you know, that that she can get it together. You know, that seems to be the general consensus in Hollywood. I would say. Well, I mean, I I also saw that a former Miss USA was arrested on DUI charges this week, but I suppose we don't think that's news anymore. <laughs> Didn't see that one. Who was this? Uh, well, her name was uh, Rima Fa- Fakik, I believe, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Feel free to let me know if I'm not. Um, she um, she was facing drunk and driving charges. She got arrested in Highland Park, Michigan. She's 26 years old, and uh, and basically uh, she she says that up until now her record hasn't had a, a single blemish, and uh, she's pretty uh, she's pretty upset about it. So so we'll see. Well. Guess what? It's got a blemish on it now. That's <laughs> right. Nothing quite like a DUR. To, a DUR nothing, like getting, to... nothing like getting caught and somebody finally says, you know something, we're writing you a ticket. So, so we have anything else in entertainment? 
I think well, that's all for entertainment. I, I, uh, you know, I just sort of gave you guys the latest rundown that's in the headlines, uh, unless you guys have anything. Cool. I have something new I want to throw into the mix here. Uh, it's a topic that we haven't discussed yet. I want to get your opinion on it. We'll head over to some real news here. Um, the situation with drones, okay? We're familiar with drones. Uh, Iran just yesterday shot down an American drone because they said it ventured into Iranian airspace. Okay. What are your opinions on drones? As far as what? Just your opinion on drones. Good, bad, yeah. indifferent. Uh, they, should they, they be used they, for law enforcement in this country? I believe in the state of Texas, uh, some Texas law enforcement agencies are thinking or considering having drones for law enforcement purposes. And then, of course, the military you, uses it, you know, overseas. Well, they take a place as a soldier or in the case of Texas law enforcement, a police officer keeping the human being out of harm's way. If whatever, I, happen to, I happen to think drones are a good idea. And you know something? If we got caught in Iranian airspace and they shot it down, shame on us. I mean, you know, it is what it is. But, I mean, if, if, if well, they're using drones now. They're using robots to go into drug ho into, into crack houses. They're using... They're yeah, it's a drone of another type, right? Right, well, they're using I mean, drones to climb, to climb volcanic mountains to get in... Uh, we're using drones on Mars. Using for, the drones on example, Mars. Mars right. rover. Yep. So... We are using them, and they are a good idea because, it, it, especially in law enforcement, that they keep the they keep the off the police officer out of harm's way, which is really what we want. And the drone is still controlled by human, but they, it's less like I think it's less likely to have a human reaction than a police officer who's, who might be in a situation where he's afraid for his life. The drone can't be killed in the same way as an officer. So he's not going to be as trigger, trigger happy as if it was might him not, might, not react, might not react as right. quickly to shoot as a, as, an, as, a, as a live officer would. We're not, and in no way are we calling police officers trigger happy. I want that to be understood in the programming. But as far as for, for it's and the same thing for the military. The drones can be used to keep unmanned, you know, an unmanned aircraft, as an example, um, is a drone in a sense, and it keeps it keep the pilot from being shot down. If the Iranians are shot down a plane, you now have a pilot who's been captured. Yes, and I, well, I think you're actually on to something uh, with that, Fred. The, the the big question is is how effective these are. You know, now that now that there's so much light shed on the drones as a military tool, and I think they're like anything. I think when used well, like any advance in technology, when used well, they're an absolutely amazing solution. When used in a way that is sort of borderline dangerous and not good or illegal, downright illegal, being in Iran's airspace, for instance, uh, it's it's a bad thing. But I think the interesting thing is, is that, you know, now they're talking about using these for journalism. They're talking about using them for air samples. They're talking about using them, you know, as you said, they, they have certain kinds of drones that go into volcanoes. And I mean, I, I think that the overall prospects on it are astoundingly useful. I mean, just really smart. You know, I think it gives us, it opens a lot of opportunities. It also allows us to go to places where we normally would not be. I mean, if you were going to go, let's say, into the rainforest in Africa, you're going to take weeks getting through some of these locations where a drone can take maybe days or even hours to get to the same location. They can be used for delivering supplies. They can be used for mapping. They can be used for rescues at sea. I mean... You know, people used to laugh. I used to tell them stories when I was in the Coast Guard that Coast Guard some Coast Guard helicopters had pigeons that were trained to see orange. And their eyesight's 100 times better than ours. They would see orange and be able to, 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 to signal the crew as to what side of the chopper to look at. If we have a drone that can do this, which is even 100 times better than that, you might be able to find something out in the open. So I, I think drones are a great idea. Very good. Well, I'm glad I brought that up. How about we move on to another exciting adventure of Holly and the Lobster Tales? Okay, here we go. The first lobster tale or little known fact is, did you know that there are coffee-flavored Pez? Second little known fact is the Hawaiian alphabet has 12 letters. And the third one is the amount American Airlines saved by eliminating one olive from every salad served in first class is $40,000, and the original color of Coke was green. Well, I'll tell you, I'm in on the coffee-flavored Pez. I like that. And the next time I go to the store. 
the Hawaiian alphabet, I knew about that, and it, that's why there's a song that Jimmy Buffett does, a uh, Hawaiian Christmas, where they say uh, Mele Kalikimaka, and that's because there aren't, there is no way, there is no way of saying Merry Christmas right. in Hawaiian, so they made it up using the alphabet that would be in the Hawaiian alphabet, coming up with that word. So I, I, I like that. I'm glad Larry brought that up. Holly, are you, I, I would imagine being the fitness trainer and everything, the fitness guru of the team here, you don't drink much soda. you have any opinion on Coca-Cola being green? Unfortunately, I'm a very bad fitness trainer. I drink a lot of diet <laughs> soda. And, and what color is your diet, Coke? Well, diet soda is, I mean, diet Coke, you know, obviously is sort of a brown color, which I, I would argue is only a very small percentage more appetizing than green. <laughs> but uh, but I got to say, a lot of the like energy drinks and stuff I've drank are much less natural colors. And I'm sure some of them have, in fact, been green. So I'm not surprised. Well, also, you remember the original Coke was actually a uh, pharmacy aid. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a pleasure beverage. It was yep. something you would drink. Yes, it you was. Know. And of course, it did all the way up until the time they sort of phased out bottles in the 70s or so it came in a green bottle anyway also yeah so i'm i'm not at all surprised to hear that but i am glad that they don't use that color anymore it would remind me of boogers <laughs> <laughs> did you have another one there larry no nope. oh, that, that was it just those four what was the fourth one the amount, it, not oh, the oh, amount the of uh, america i say forty thousand no. dollars by taking one olive out of salad to serve to first class they should have kept it so, going taking two out of the coach and they would save more money it's a lot of money for an olive didn't they, they didn't they just file for bankruptcy too yeah i guess it didn't work yes, yes, yes they, they did they didn't take enough olives yep oh, they should have okay. taken out two olives instead of just one <laughs> it, it wasn't enough <laughs> <laughs> right. So I guess that's our uh, lobster tales for this week. So Fred, what kind of obits do we have? And then we can well, start we wrapping Well, we have up. an obit. Uh, for those of you that may remember uh, Rowan and Martin's laughing from the '60s, actor Alan Sue's passed away on uh, the on, on December 1st at age 85. Uh, he was known for playing outlandish and effeminate characters on television. He died at 85 years old. He died Tuesday while watching television at his home in West Hollywood, just outside Los Angeles. His longtime friend Michael Greg Macho instead on the site. He was recently been in poor health. Um, was re from 68 to 1972. He's a recurring member of the NBC show Roland Martin's Laughing, playing an eccentric child's host named Uncle Al, the kiddies pal, and an effeminate sports character called Big Al. Big Al here in the old wrestling diamond. <laughs> Featurette. Oh, I dig my tinkle. <laughs> I dig any tinkle. I'm a tinkle digger. Get it? <laughs> well, I just returned from the bobsled races, and I feel it's about time somebody exposed them. Bobsleds, indeed. The one I saw belonged to a guy named Irvy. And the guys that ride them, I mean, all squashed holding on to each other on that silly little sled. I don't like to see that in public. Ta-da! I hope he was at least watching reruns of Ronan Martin's Laughing when he died. He was uh, After Laughing, Sue's performed on Broadway in the 70s as Professor Moriarty in the play Sherlock Holmes. He's, survi he's sur uh, survived by two nieces and nephews. Uh, he uh, also admitted later on that he was gay, having been married for five years, 1953 to 1958. There isn't much about it. There, there, there are articles about things that happened, but he, he was a um, very funny man. And there are pictures. And if you don't know who he was or what he looked like, there are pictures of him up all over the Internet. So we will rest in peace, Al, and uh, loved you when you were on stage. I, 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 I loved the show, and he just made the show go. And my prayer is is that when uh, St. Peter says, would you like me to open the gates, he says, suck it to me. That's it. <laughs> okay, there was, they did, there's too. One, okay, there's one thing I seem to remember about Alan Seuss, and I heard it as a rumor, but it might have been true, is that he was on Laugh-In, and he was the one with the, uh, the rain hat and the slicker, and he would ride the tricycle on stage. No, that was Artie, that was Artie Johnson. Artie Johnson. Oh, it was? Oh, I thought... Oh. Artie Johnson. Yep. Oh, I thought it was Alan Seuss. Okay. No, Alan Johnson. Right church, wrong pew. Yep. No. Well, she remembers the show. Yep. Oh, laughing. I'm surprised, I'm surprised I Holly knows about the show. 
Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I watched that. Maybe it's because I watched Nick at Night as a kid. So I watched like uh, Dobie McGillis. I watched, okay. I watched Dobie tons McGillis? of that. Dobie McGillis. I, I wanted to be, oh, thank you. I wanted to be, uh, I mean, before she was famous, I wanted to be Goldie Hawn. I mean, you know, before I understood who she was as an adult even, I wanted, you know, I wanted to wear a white bikini and paint my face. I thought I was a hippie for like the first like 15 years <laughs> of my life. And laughing had a lot to do with that. I think it you was one of. You to be girl? Yes, the Sakatumi girl, and I—I uh, I actually did an off-Broadway show, produced an off-Broadway show when I lived in New York. Uh, that was that was very highly influenced by Laughing. We did a sketch comedy with music and performance, and uh, and it was it was very popular. We sold out. Actually, it was a limited run. We were like three nights, and we sold out every single night. I mean, we filled the place to the ceiling. It was oh, very good, popular, good. and people still need Laughing, whatever anybody else says. So that wraps up um, show number twenty of As We See It, and uh, we'll see you guys again next Sunday for show number 21 as we stumble on to number 40. The show comes of age. From the studios of Basenet Internet Television in Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. From the studios of Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boas. And from out in the sticks here in St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brookline, I'm the lobster. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night. Good night.